suspect that their home away from home is a haunted hotel. But lavish lobbies and inviting bedrooms can be home to legendary terrors. And now and then, an innkeeper's story will reveal a history alive with horror. They are stories that terrify. It was the most frightening time of my life. And stories that chill. It gets kind of creepy when you remember what happened there. Be our guest as we travel a world where memories haunt and phantoms lurk. And the impossible lies just around the corner. thrill when there is a chance your hotel is home to a spirit from beyond. In fact, many travelers seek out hotels with tales of hauntings. But not everyone wants to actually see a ghost. They'll come in and say, well, I want to stay in a haunted hotel, but I don't want to stay in a haunted bedroom, you know. I want to be next door, so if anything goes on, I'll hear the people who are in the haunted room run out. But what is a guest to do when all the rooms are said to be haunted. Ghosts seem to be accepted by the English as a natural part of the landscape. With its rich history and turbulent past, many believe the spirits of those who died on English soil remain there today. It's sort of almost part of the, the, the psyche, the English psyche. So this idea of um, spirits being associated with the land is very, very old uh, and, and very much part of British culture. Along with ghosts, pubs are synonymous with the English culture and way of life. And it is Kirkston Pass Inn, one of the oldest pubs in the world, that is said to be one of England's most haunted. This place is full of spirits. But one of the, the spookiest ones is a, a slithery, cold thing. Kirkston Pass Inn sits 1,500 feet above sea level in the Cumbria region of northern England, making it one of the highest buildings in the country. It was originally a coaching inn. The foundations take back to about 2,000 years. You see, talking a building that you know, predates the birth of Jesus Christ. And the pub was actually built on a certain beer in 1496 when Henry VIII, I think, was 13, so quite a lot of beers have gone out this place. <laughs> the inn's nearest neighbour is seven miles down the treacherous mountain pass. It's like being in God's back garden, you know, but when the mist rolls down, it's like you're in the middle of the clouds, you know, and it swirls, and it swirls around the windows, and if you could imagine sort of what Jack the Ripper's fog was like, it's just like that, you can't see at all. It looks like someone's holding a white blanket in front of the window pane. Many have lost their way, never to be seen again, when the weather in the tranquil pass suddenly gives way to unexpected storms. One of the victims of the mountain pass was a young mother named Ruth Ray. The story of Ruth Ray dates from the early 1800s, and in those days, you know, poor people didn't have any other transport apart from their feet. Ruth was at home, tending her newborn son, when she received the news that her father was on his deathbed. This part of England is very mountainous, and um, if, you, if you wanted to go somewhere, you had to walk. Ruth set out over the pass to see her father. She had to take a baby with her. So she walked up Kirkstone Pass in the snow, and nothing was heard from her. You're literally on the edge up here. And if you were to walk out and the pub was closed, 
and the mist came down, you would never find your way back. You, you would walk off the edge. You just wouldn't find your way. You can't see it. It's, it's so dangerous up here. You can imagine um, the emotions of a woman walking, knowing probably she's going to die, and also knowing that her child may die. There's no hope. The despair must have been incredible. Ruth's frozen, lifeless body was later found near Kirkston Pass Inn, just a few feet away from the warmth and shelter that could have saved her. In Ruth's arms lay her infant son. By a miracle, she'd wrapped the child in a shawl and the, the child somehow been kept warm and sheltered by its mother's body and the baby son was alive. Some say Ruth's love for her child is what keeps her spirit at Kirkston Pass Inn. The reports of seeing a woman cradling a baby, seeing a woman looking for something, hearing a baby crying. Ruth's wintry spirit is said to be shrouded in despair, doomed to search forever for the child she was never able to raise. The very stones of the old inn are etched with the misery of the wretched souls who left this life too soon. Kirkston Pass is also thought to be home to another spirit, one who is only a child himself. Never was a young lad, you know, was probably maybe 10, 11 years of age. Kirkston Pass Inn was one of the first coaching inns along the busy trade route to Scotland. And long ago, Neville was the son of the inn's carriage master. Wagons used to come up, change the teams of horses, people maybe come in and have a beer or stay the night. Neville eagerly awaited each new traveler who came up the pass until one day his excitement led to disaster. He heard carriage coming. He walked into the road and we didn't stop. They ran him down. He died. They killed him. And the coach didn't stop at all. It just went straight on to Scotland. He's one of our, one of our people that stay with us now. At Kirkston Pass Inn, it is believed that Neville's impish spirit is the force behind many baffling pranks. One evening in particular, I'd done the cashing out, put the burglar alarms on, locked all the doors, went to my home. When I came in in the morning, all the chairs were all stacked on top of the tables. All the paintings we had on the wall were all taken down and were laid on the seats. Couldn't believe it, you know. And that's the sort of little tricks that he gets up to. Hotel staff say they've grown accustomed to Neville's mischief. The lights come on when they should be off and doors are locked and they should be open. You definitely get a feeling you're sharing it with, with you know, another entity, I suppose. He's a kid, he's having fun. It's as if you can hear him laughing at you, you know. He's like your naughty grandkid or, or your naughty son, but not malicious. Locals believe that lurking within the walls of Kirkston are much darker spirits. Ghosts whose identities are not known and whose malevolent intentions are a mystery. One ghost is considered the most evil of all its specters. A mere mention of its existence is strictly prohibited within the pub. One evening, my maintenance manager and myself were cashing up when we heard somebody walk across the sink. We had a dog with us at the time, so we went up the stairs opened the door to the corridor and tried to make the dog go first, being brave. <laughs> she wouldn't go. She sat down and totally refused to go. So you can imagine two big guys, right? One saying, you go first. No, you go first, you know. Somehow, they knew these noises were neither the pranks of a young boy nor the cries of a desperate mother, but something far more terrifying. We burst into the first room, opened the door, Flashlights everywhere, nothing. So I went to the second room, hearts bumping, you know, nothing. So now we know that whatever is in the last room, because there's no other way out of the pub, and this is the final room. We took a big deep breath and burst into the room. I saw something black flash across the side of the wall, and it kind of like dissolved through the wall. 
It was something evil. It made you scared. That was the most frightening time of my life. Most who have experienced this evil apparition are silenced by fear. I was petrified. And so was my maintenance manager. He went white, you know. And I said to him, well, <laughs> what was it? What do you think? And he said, oh, look, I don't want to talk about it. I want nothing to do with it. Uh, um, just, uh, we mustn't speak about this. And he walked out. Staff at Kirkston Pass Inn say the many spirits, good and evil, will always make their presence known. At times we've looked out and you, you see people along the road. You go outside the door and there's nobody there. They want to know about you and, and you want to know about them. Sometimes things happen and we just accept it. Up next, we'll visit Louisiana's Bayou Country, where the spirit of a Cajun French widow has some unfinished business. It gets kind of creepy when you remember what happened there. Each year, tourists flock to vacation spots all over the world. They can choose a four-star hotel, historic castle, or a homey bed and breakfast. But what they can't always choose is who or what ghostly being might join them on their stay. The living are drawn to Louisiana's Cajun country for exceptional music, food, and good times. The region is so full of spirit that even its ghosts seem more lively. It is there in Lafayette that a bed and breakfast known as tea frères is said to harbor a spirit whose passion for life has never dimmed. Amelie has been seen, heard in all the rooms in the old part of the house. It's just You name the room and I'll tell you the story. Even the attic. Even the attic. At first, the owners of the 1880s farmhouse were not aware that their new bed and breakfast had a supernatural reputation. We were moved in within two weeks after we saw the house and we were so excited to be in this house that it just never occurred to us that it was haunted it was all too easy to laugh off the warnings that the house was home to a cajun french ghost named amelie i said the ghost in this house i said i don't think so i've been here two weeks i haven't seen a ghost <laughs> that's how much i knew about ghosts Amelie picked a day when no one was home to make her presence known. A young man had come to the Frere house. He knocked on the door and no one answered. And when he looked up, there was a woman standing in the window. And when she saw him, she stepped back and closed the curtain. The face in the window matched the description of someone who lived at T. Frere's long ago. More than a century earlier, the house was home to a young widow who came there for her ritual period of mourning. The customs of the day required her to wear black and remain isolated from the world for a year. Her name was Amelie Kumo. After her young husband died, she came here to T. Frere's house to, for her year of mourning, which was very traditional a hundred years ago. In those days, all widows had strict codes of conduct. The only place she went was upstairs on the balcony to for fresh air and sunshine because they didn't circulate in in public for a year after you know death like that. It's called a widow's walk. And it's very appropriate for Amelie, I guess. Amelie had lost her husband, but not her Cajun spirit. And before long, she rebelled against her confinement. Amelie could be seen cavorting around, taking her bonnet off and letting her hair fly, which was a no-no in those days, a hundred years ago. Amelie was Cajun to the max. She was kind of eye, a wild little rebellious spirit, you could call it. Uh, she did things out of the ordinary. Amelie never remarried and lived alone at T. Frères until at the age of 32, she was stricken with fever. The ghost of Amelie Lee is still here because of the tragic uh, circumstances of her death. All alone, with no one to call a doctor, Amelie's fever grew dangerous. And finally, half delirious, 
she went in search of water. It was a deadly decision. She walked from the house through the garden to the well. She had a fever and it was at night. And no one knows whether she jumped or fell. But she drowned in the well in the backyard. I'd like to believe she fell. Yeah. Yeah. The dawn found T. Frere's house dark and silent. It was a tragic death. The church ruled it a suicide and didn't bury her in hollow ground. It is uh, uh, a bad thing, you know. It means your body's not blessed. Can it be that Amelie's wild spirit refuses to accept the judgment passed on her? And not to be buried in hollow ground is, is very upsetting. Therefore, she's a restless spirit. I think that Amelie was determined to, to make us believers because shortly after we moved in, things began to happen. She threw bread around the kitchen, and when things go flying in, in the house and you don't see anyone doing the throwing, you know, it's certainly suspect of a spirit. Amelie is quick to make it known when she is displeased. And the thing that displeases her the most is change. Anytime you change things in the house, Amelie doesn't like it. One day, the former owner of T. Frères decided to reorganize the kitchen. But as soon as she left the room, she heard a noise that chilled her to the bone. She heard this crash, bang, bang stuff falling. And she ran back, and all of her ketchup and minas and pickles and blah, blah, blah was on the floor, broken. Though prone to mischief, one day, Amelie revealed a streak of compassion towards Tifrere's former owner. She was upstairs in her bedroom, very ill with the flu. And she says someone covered her with a blanket, and now we have to believe it was Amelie. She was sick herself that way and probably could identify with fever and illness. Don't you think? Good ghost. Good ghost. But when new owners took over the bed and breakfast and began to rearrange the kitchen, T. Frere's once again became a battleground. Evidently, she didn't like the way I had changed the decorations in the kitchen. About two days later, we hear this god-awful noise like someone was back there. to death. At long last, the noise stopped. We tiptoed back there like we were going to wake up somebody after all this noise. And we looked, and we looked, and we looked. Shad, there was nothing out of place. Not a thing. And I still don't understand that. Surprisingly, the guests at T. Frères don't seem to mind sharing their rooms with a ghost. My guests love her. And it, it makes for good table conversation at breakfast. Everybody's got their little stories, you know. I had a uh, doctor come and, and looking for her. During the night, someone kept pulling his toes, and he finally figured out it had to be her. Some of them, it takes only one night to make a believer out of them. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Can it be that Amelie longs to return to the world of the living? I'm the exterminator here at the Tea Fire House. I've been spraying this place here for, I'd say, eight, eight, nine years. One day, words dropped by chance led to an unforeseen encounter. I said, man, I'd love to meet her, you know, and I kind of said that jokingly, and so I commenced to spraying the house. Well, I opened the attic door, and uh, when I did, I seen this bright light looking at me. I couldn't understand what she was saying except one word. Van water and means come see. I shook my head no. Trying to scream, nothing wanted to come out. Finally, he managed to pull himself away. Then came again, bounding down the steps and out the back door, didn't tell me what was going on. I went chasing him out the back. Glenn, Glenn, what's the matter? What's the matter? He said, you got something in that attic. I ain't going back up there. He was upset. I know a big old guy like me scared of something like that. 
But I tell you one thing, I'll never say I want to meet her again. <laughs> when the story got around, everyone agreed it was classic Amelie. Amelie is typical, typical of the Cajun character. Con eye, mischievous, a lot of fun, making jokes, having a good time. You know, she's just typical, typical Cajun character to me. Laissez le bon temps rouler. Let the good times roll. <laughs> One sad reminder of Amelie's death rests in the shadows of T. Frere's house, the remains of the old well. When we moved in to the house, the well had been filled in already, but it was beginning to sink again, so we filled it in again. It gets kind of creepy when that well sinks again, and you, you remember what happened there. As long as Tifrere stands, the owners believe Amelie will continue to visit and remind everyone whose home it was first. Coming into Tifrere's house has really made me a believer. I thought I believed before, but honey, something's going on in that spiritual world that we have no control of. None at all. Coming up, we'll check into San Diego's Horton Grant Hotel. 19th century gambler still stacks the decks and a brothel madam from a lawless time is back in business a knock at the door late at night might be room service but if your hotel room is said to be haunted think twice before letting anyone in with its sunny streets lined with restaurants and shops the gas lamp district of San Diego looks like an ideal place to spend a vacation. But this well-kept area has a sordid past, and some say the ghostly reminders of that dangerous time still call the district and the Horton Grand Hotel home. It was pretty much an um, uncivilized western-type gunslinging area. Although the Horton Grand was constructed in 1988, each brick of the hotel holds over a century of history. Assembled almost entirely out of the remains of two demolished 19th century hotels, today's Horton Grand stands in the heart of San Diego's former red light district. The Horton Grand is pretty much right in the middle of the original gas lamp quarter. Wyatt Earp uh, owned property here and had gambling halls. In the early days, it was lined with saloons and bordellos. One of the district's most crooked characters is said to have taken up permanent residence at the Horton Grand a century after his murder. Roger Whitaker was at the center of some sordid but prosperous business dealings in 19th century San Diego. Roger was a pimp and a gambler. He is a shady character. Roger's devious ways eventually caught up with him. Obviously, Roger was not a real likable person when he was alive. Apparently, he ran afoul of some of his cronies. And they done him in. Today, Roger is said to haunt room 309 and lives much as he did over a hundred years ago. I've had people call down to the front desk and tell me that they had left their room and their change was on the fireplace and it had all been stacked up neatly like so many poker chips. Could it be that Roger just wants to get back in the game? I've had someone call down and say that they had been playing cards and they very neatly put them back but when they returned to their room, they were laid out in poker hands. I have heard guests comment that there is the sound of shuffling cards and poker chips. Roger's just going about what he knows best. Not all of Roger's hauntings have to do with his favorite pastime. 
The armoire doors in 309 have been noticed to open. The beds shake. And sometimes all Roger wants is his privacy. On more than one occasion, the room when it is unoccupied has been known to be dead bolted from the inside. Now, that one we cannot explain. According to local lore, another ghost with a scandalous past has also made the Horton Grand home. Her name is Ida Bailey. In 1887, when Ida came to town, prostitution was just part of the landscape. It was tolerated, although illegal. Ida set out to make her fortune during San Diego's late 19th century boom. She was quite a businesswoman, an ambitious, fiery redhead, so she decided that she should be a madam. She decided she was going to have the best bordello in town, and she did. It was really the first classy bordello and brought a little bit of class to the district that was so wild. In 1912, the district was shut down and Ida closed up shop. But now it seems Ida has come out of retirement and treats some guests at the Horton Grant Hotel as prospective clients. She also likes to visit room 209 here in the hotel. And her little trick is she will knock on the door. And if a woman answers, nobody will be there. But if a man answers, Ida will be there but will slowly fade away. So she's still looking around. Aside from the girls in her brothel, Ida never had much of a relationship with women. Apparently, Ida does want the men to see her, and uh, the women never wanted to see her when she was alive, and I guess she doesn't want them to see her while she's in their present form. Staff and guests at the Horton Grand feel they share their hotel with spirits who just want to reclaim the scandalous lives they once led in the gas lamp district. It was a very dynamic, happening community. It probably represents a lot of good times for the spirits that were here and are here. Up next, we'll travel to France to visit a count in his medieval castle and hear how his ancestor is still paying for her centuries-old sins. When you spend the night in a haunted hotel, locking your door won't keep out the guests who don't need keys. The town of Sarlat in the southwest of France is a jumble of medieval houses on crooked stone streets. Looming nearby is the 13th century Chateau du Puy-Martin. There, foot-sore travelers may sleep in ancient splendor and perhaps hear a ghost story from a member of the ghost's own family. This castle has belonged to my family since 1450. For five and a half centuries, the de Montbron family have been the owners of the chateau. In recent years, they have opened up their ancestral home to guests. The most ancient section is the North Tower. It's from the 1200s. The oldest part of Puy Martin is also the setting for its strangest story. It all began with the de Montbron's ancestor, the lady of the chateau, Thérèse de Saint Clair. The lady lived in the 17th century. She was very beautiful. And her husband was very, very jealous. Therese's husband, the Lord of Puy Martin, 
was at the forefront of Catholic forces fighting the Protestants during France's religious wars. He fight against Protestants, but he was very often out of his castle. And she was alone in this cold castle. While her Catholic husband fought the Protestants, Therese waited. And before long, she found a companion in her loneliness. He was a Protestant knight. She met a young knight, a jeune chevalier. And uh, it's a love story. But their love was not meant to be. One day, her husband returned without warning, and he found her in the arms of a lover. Dans les bras de son amant. They came back, and he surprised his wife with the young knight. And it was terrible. And above all, the young knight was. Protestant. He found in his castle a Protestant with his wife. Ah, terrible. In his fury, the husband killed the knight, then dragged his wife up the stone steps of the North Tower. He was a wicked, jealous man, and his wife had dishonored his name, the name of his ancestors. Mad with rage, he locked her up in a small room at the top of the North Tower. It was the last time Therese would ever cross the threshold. Slow months went by, but her husband never relented. And 15 years after she entered the room, she died still a captive. Unforgiving to the last, Therese's husband buried her body in the tower wall to make certain she would remain in her prison for all eternity. But unexplainable events suggest that in death, if not in life, Therese has finally escaped her prison and now haunts the chateau as the White Lady of Puy Martin. The one lady aren't still uh, the castle. My father met her and guest too. Just beneath the white lady's chamber lies a guest room. There, four years ago, a guest from Texas woke to an eerie sight. The Texan saw the white lady in the, in the room, in the guest room. He saw just a face on a curtain. And he was very, very upset. When he told his hosts the story, they were not surprised. Most of the time, uh, the white lady appeared to the man. And it's funny because uh, the guest, uh, Texan, who saw the white lady was Protestant. And she liked Protestant, I think so. <laughs> and, and, and he was alone. It's the reason why uh, he was Protestant alone, uh, wonderful. <laughs> The Count remembers seeing his ancestor face to face. I saw the white lady twice. The first time it was a transparent form. A very beautiful lady on the staircase in front of the room she lived in for so long. And that lasted less than five seconds, but it seemed like a long time. The second time I saw her, it was by her room. Those who have seen the White Lady say that after each taste of freedom, she always returns to her room of suffering. Today, the Count wonders if he has seen his sad ancestor for the last time. She shows herself mostly to young men. Therefore, I may never have the chance to see her again. And one member of the Montbrun family is still waiting to meet her. My father saw the lady, but me, I, I never saw the lady. I'm sad.
I should want to meet the lady and, and to speak perhaps with Miss L, to, to see her. Uh, it's my wish, really. Puy Martin's greatest mystery remains entombed forever within the walls of the old North Tower. We don't know today if, if, if uh, our body is still there. We suppose, but we don't want to, to know the mystery of the castle. When my father said, don't touch anything there, don't dig the wall. We want to keep the mystery. Coming up with the guests on the southern plantation, where the lady of the house still keeps watch for pirates. They trusted her and she trusted them. And that was really her problem. They came here to do a rather terrible deed. In haunted hotels, sometimes it's not the guests, but the ghosts who have made early departures. Along the bayous of Louisiana, soft breezes sway the Spanish moss. The setting seems too serene for the violence that once shattered the peace at the plantation home of Cretien Point. There's blood stains in the closet where he stayed the night. Two hours west of New Orleans, Cretien Point's 1831 plantation house is so evocative of the Old South that even Hollywood once looked to it for inspiration. There was a photographer, and he came out here, and he took pictures of Cretien Point, the stairway particularly. The photographer had heard the plantation's dark story, that the stairway was the site of a violent killing long ago. There was going to be a killing on the stairway in the movie, so he took pictures of the arched windows in the stairway, and indeed, Hollywood copied the stairway from Cretien Point for Tara's in the movie Gone with the Wind. This Louisiana version of Terra once was home to its very own Scarlet. Very much like in the movie Gone with the Wind, there was also a young woman, and she was a very independent soul. Her name was Felicite Cretien. She was the first liberated woman of Louisiana. She rode her horse astride like a man, and she smoked cigars and she gambled. Felicite's husband had died young, leaving his wife with a challenge. And that meant Felicite had to take over running of the plantation. And she did quite well. She was quite a good businesswoman. But running the farm was far from the only business at Cretian Point. For years, the plantation had been financed, in part, by dealings with pirates. They accumulated a lot of goods. And they would buy and sell here at what is now known as Cretian Point. The stolen goods were sold here. She did what she had to do to survive. She kept up the contraband dealings, the black market dealings, and uh, that's how she got herself in with a little bit of the trouble that ended up happening over here. Late one night, Felicite heard her door opening and realized instantly that her days of dealing with pirates were over. She knew she was in trouble. She grabbed a handful of jewelry and a pistol, and she went and stood at the head of the stairs and waited. And sure enough, one of the pirates was on his way up the stairs. She just waited for that perfect moment. In the darkened staircase, Felicite wanted to make her one bullet count. She shook her jewelry in front of her and said, don't come any further. And Felicite really was saying, come a little bit closer. I can't see you well enough yet. So as he came up the stairs, not close enough to her, she pulled the pistol out, shot him in the head and killed him. Aware that the other pirates might come in search of their comrade, 
Felicite dragged the body downstairs. They took his body and put it in the cabinet under the stairs for the rest of the night, and he finished bleeding under, under there. In the morning, the servants carried away the pirate's body. But some feel that his spirit remained behind. So that is one of our ghosts. We call him Robert. And uh, Robert, we don't make fun of. Robert has been known to go to great lengths to assure that people take him seriously. My first cousin came to dinner, and I was telling him about the ghosts, and he says, you're crazy to believe in things like that. Pounded on the table, he said, there's no such things in, as a ghost, and you know it. And the French doors of the dining room that were latched, and they opened up all by themselves. Just beyond the doors lies the closet that once served as the pirate's makeshift tomb. So from then on, we talk about Robert. We mention that he's there, and, but we don't make fun of him. But Chrétien Point's most active spirit seems to be Robert's old adversary, the lady of the house. The house is absolutely a no-smoking zone, but at times, you will smell cigar smoke in the house. When we smell that cigar light up, we know it's Miss Felicite. None of us smoke cigars. And all of a sudden, that just hits you out of nowhere. Just the smell of cigar, strong. Of course, this was her house first, so we allowed her to smoke in the house. At times, the objects in Felicite's home appear to be moved by unseen hands. There was this rocking chair in the room from the 1800s, but nobody was sitting in the chair. And all of a sudden, that rocking chair started rocking. The next day, one of the docents was giving a tour, and she told the story of yesterday, the chair rocking. And her back was to the chair, and a gentleman on the tour said, well, look, it's rocking now. Nobody was in the chair, and there was the chair rocking. So she said, well, enough of that. Let's go out on the gallery. The doors to the gallery opened by themselves. Can this be the work of Felicite still guarding her home? Maybe she's out there looking for the pirates to come back again. And who knows? Haunted hotels are filled with the poignant tales of souls who cannot seem to rest in peace. The entities that are stuck in the hotel, they like to let the people that are visiting know that they are present and they don't want you to mess with them. This is their territory. Perhaps it's a violent death that keeps them trapped. That there was an event that somebody became murdered or died in, in a room or a hotel. That spirit is trapped in that hotel. Or perhaps it's simply home. This is just a reminder to subscribe to enjoy our growing collection of paranormal content. Don't forget to like your favorite episode and ring the bell to be notified of new content. As always, thanks for watching.